Um, and, and we started this program around 1996 when um, we determined. Who's looking? get back to uh, advancing a slide. Um, we, we started this program in uh, the mid-1990s um, when I was uh, much younger and had just uh, come to Washington. And we started because the Cold War had ended and, and much of Latin America had seen transitions to democracy and, and uh, the ends of civil wars. Um, but we were noticing um, that a lot was still going on. You know, there were open bases and we were uh, having exercises and there were arms transfers going on. And we started gathering this information very systematically and decided the best way to keep it in one place was this website, which you can find at JUSTF.org. Um, and we just sort of made that where we keep stuff. Um, and, and there's pages for all kinds of assistance, such as um, military and police assistance. And this since the mid-90s mid has allowed us to track, you know, what, what has gone to which country. You can see that Colombia and Mexico have dominated that. It's um, allowed us to track... Uh, military and police training, uh, not just numbers by country like you see here, but how many people went to the uh, former school of the Americas and what were they taught in? How many people were trained in their country by whom? Um, and, and just throwing this all up into a huge database and, and making it public at the same time, you know, rather than keeping our file cabinet, this made more sense. The other thing that we've tried to keep track of and has been harder um, have been just this, this proliferation of contacts, uh, exercises, deployments, bases ways in which our military works with militaries of Latin America. Um, and uh, uh, we're, we're still working on that. There's a lot of stuff up on just the facts, but it's not as systematic. And um, it's often we, 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 we get things in a more episodic way. Now, getting information, of course, is the cornerstone of this. You've got to be um, uh, developing uh, 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 ways and channels and, and, and regular ways that you can actually keep getting the most up-to-date data about what we're doing with whom where. Um, and there's a couple ways of doing this. I mean, the most easy way is just getting your hands on all the official reports. Everything in Just the Facts is primary sources. If somebody reports in the Washington Post that there is, you know, we sent uh, three F-16s to a country, uh, we're not going to buy that. We'll, 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 have, we'll have to get some uh, official footnote. Um, you know, if somebody just tells us in an interview that, you know, they gave $20 million to Guatemala, that's not enough either. We need it more exact if we need the exact document. So the first place you go is the official reports in the law. Um, the Foreign Assistance Act um, uh, and, and the annual op, uh, uh, foreign aid appropriations bills, as well as the defense bills, um, which I'll talk about in a little while, um, all include uh, reports. Uh, the Congress, which has the power of the purse, demands that um, the state, Pentagon, and others report back on how they're spending the aid. Now, these reports vary widely in quality. There's a lot of holes in them, and then sometimes there's a lot of repetition. But um, we have uh, right now two pages on just the facts where we're trying to at least like, hold the original um, documents. Uh, we're, we're developing an almost done with the one on the right, which will make everything searchable, and you can pull things out and, and actually read them right there on the page. Um, reports are important. Um, some of the main ones would be uh, the, um, the annual aid request or the annual budget justification for the upcoming fiscal year um, that, that uh, the state and defense departments, especially the state department, send to uh, Congress every year. They would have to lay out how much they gave every country according to the main uh, aid programs of the previous year, what they expect to spend the current year, and what's coming up next year. Um, so we'll see um, in, in the foreign military financing program, in the international narcotics and law enforcement program, what their plans are and what they actually ended up spending the year before, what kinds of aid they gave um, to the countries in the region, and throw that up in the database. Um, another main one uh, that's been important for us is one that's called the Foreign Military Training and Engagement Activities. Um, that's one that Joy and I actually pressured to have put in the law. Um, and it, um, it details uh, um, for the previous year um, how many people from each country they trained and what programs paid for it, what were the courses they received, and what were the units they belonged to. DOD fudges a lot of this. I think the record keeping isn't great. DOD is the public point, sorry. The record keeping isn't great. I mean, they uh, intend to uh, um, um, fudge like what a unit is. They'll just say Army or something. Um, but it is still, you know, a, a useful report. There are several others, um, uh, ranging from arms sales to uh, uh, special forces deployments in the previous year to humanitarian um, um, uh, exercises and, and several others. And we, we try to concatenate all of that. But the reports only go so far, ultimately. They, uh, I just don't know how you got that advanced slide uh, bar to come up. Oh, the green thing. The green thing does everything. Okay. Um, 
reports themselves don't do everything. Um, they leave a lot of holes. They're very general, and they're often late. Um, and so if we have a specific request for a kind of information, what kind of aid did you give to Unit X? Or uh, what, uh, what, what, what is the delivery schedule for aid to, to, to uh, Mexico? Um, or um, you know, uh, School of the Americas, uh, how, many, how many Hondurans did you train this year? Um, you've got to go directly to the, the agencies themselves. Um, first, I mean, the only, the only story is have to at least try uh, by calling, having meetings, um, ultimately developing relationships with key people in the bureaucracy in charge of the program that you're interested in. Um, this, um, yeah, this is labor intensive and it's, and it's hard and, and these, people, uh, change, these people change every couple of years anyway. But you should at least have someone you can call, be it on, see, for me, the Columbia desk at the State Department or the Defense Security Cooperation Agency or the U.S. Southern Command Field Office and just see if I can get, can you just give me the PowerPoint about this exercise so I can find out what you did. Um, and, and sometimes they do and sometimes uh, they say no, but even the most often is they say, when do you get back to you on that? And then you have to nag them again in a couple of weeks and they'll say, oh, yeah, we're working on that. And, again in a week. And, and you never get to the no. You never get to the, just, I can't give you that, I'm not allowed. Or I can't give you that, that's classified. Or you see, don't ask me, ask this person. You, know, you get that sometimes. But getting to the no is almost as hard as getting to the yes sometimes, sometimes harder. Um, when that happens, uh, we like to turn to Congress. Because uh, it's harder to say no to the people who are actually you know, uh, voting to pay for this. Um, and friendly members of Congress uh, who have usually, uh, we get a friendly members of Congress to make the request. Now, if it's if it's in a relatively easy request, um, uh, we usually go to a some of our best friends in Congress who care deeply about Latin America, um, but may be backbenchers or may not be on the relevant committees, and they can write the letter and they'll do it you know loyally and they'll and they'll, they'll, they'll share everything with you and they're great um, about it. If it's a more specific or more sensitive or tougher or more really specific, why would anybody else care about this kind of request? Um, we have to go to staff of uh, the committees uh, that have oversight responsibility for these programs. Um, the main ones, um, and I'll talk about these in a minute, uh, are uh, the foreign affairs, uh, uh, our armed services, and then the relevant appropriations subcommittees. And the appropriations ones are the ones that are gold. I mean, if the appropriations people ask for information, uh, if they deign to do that favor, um, they uh, they will get a response because they're the ones who vote for the money, and they you know everybody wants to be on their good side, um, <clears throat> and, and that, that tends to work best. Um, sometimes, um, if there's a chronic problem, it's easier just to um, you know uh, during the annual budget process. A, you know, a quick recommendation. It would surely be great if you put in the law in the court language that there'd be a report about X. And you know, that, that, that does happen quite often. Um, if that doesn't work, um, and sometimes it won't work because committee staff will say, oh, uh, uh -huh. or they'll say, uh, uh, or, 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 you know, you're, you're, you're friendly but less clout outfield, you're, 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 fr you're friendly but less a uh, heavyweight member of Congress or, or staff won't be able to get the response for you, then you're, you're, you're in trouble. I mean, you, you, you really are only left with uh, doing a FOIA request or, you know, of course, going public and trying to embarrass uh, uh, the, 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 the uh, bureaucracy for not being forthcoming. But usually if it's a report that's so technical that no reporter will care about it, mm -hmm. you're just stuck with the Freedom of Information Act. And then uh, you file that request. And maybe I'm not so good at following them. Maybe the people, I know the people at the National Security Archive are professionals at this, nsarchive.org, and get better responses, often with the threat of litigation. But when we just put in a FOIA request, it usually takes a year and a half uh, to get what we're looking for. Even if we're asking for, even if we're asking for a report that's already in the law, it can take a while just to get. Um, so that's the FOIA channel. Now, just getting into, uh, um, there, there's, there's two main channels through which the aid uh, that we track go through. The first, uh, and, and they correspond to bills in the federal budget. The federal budget is divided into 13 different bills every year, and there's two that are really relevant, most relevant to what we do. And the first, and, and by a, a significant amount, two thirds uh, a majority of, of the military aid that we track in Latin America goes through the state foreign operations bill and process. Um, this is um, pays for almost all, the majority of grant aid it pays for actually a minority of training. Most trainees these days in Latin America are paid for the defense budget. Um, and, uh, these, and these are the civilians who are supposed to oversee aid programs and sales programs. Um, 
the uh, State Department, Congress requires that the State Department uh, uh, report much more on the aid they give. There's a lot of, uh, uh, you know, as, as you know, um, in, in the Congress, foreign aid is not a very popular topic. Uh, foreign aid is not perceived as you know, bringing jobs into your districts, and, and you know, a lot of conservatives like to call it throwing money down a rat hole. So foreign aid bill does get a lot more scrutiny. Uh, than, than the other channel that I'll be talking about. Congress does require them to report uh, in some level of detail, and it's easier to get answers because they, there's enough skepticism about uh, uh, the need for foreign aid that, that it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a committee looks over everything with a green eye shade. Uh, um, the State Department, however, rarely responds to direct requests. If, if, you know, if, if I just say, can you give me the PowerPoint, they'll generally uh, say, uh, call me later. Um, and <laughs> or they'll even say no. State, I find that the diplomats are less forthcoming with information. Um, the committees in Congress that oversee this aid and that are looking at the degree my shade are, again, the committee uh, of, of the House and Senate. These are not very uh, bipartisan committees. The, 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 the Republicans and Democrats are always at each other's throats. They rarely pass legislation, although they're supposed to every year pass legislation sort of uh, uh, authorizing the program that, that, that give this aid out, but they rarely do. Uh, they often come to sort of debating societies. Uh, that does mean, however, that committee staff have a bit more free time to do requests on your behalf um, uh, when they actually get around to doing it. Um, the, and the other uh, committee that matters, uh, actually matters more because they actually do pass a bill every year, are the Foreign Operations Subcommittees of Appropriations. Uh, and uh, in, in the Senate, that's uh, uh, Senator Leahy's uh, committee. And, and right now in, in, in the House, it's uh, Senator uh, Congresswoman Kay Granger from uh, K.K. Granger from Texas. Now, again, they do look over things uh, a bit more closely um, and uh, have a bit more of an open door. The other channel, and it is a growing channel, and if you're not working right in America, it may be growing even faster, um, is the Defense Department uh, uh, and, you know, the $700 billion Defense Department budget, for which, you know, the, uh, the $300 million or so that go to, as far as military, go in the form of military employees to Latin America, are just mostly dust. So it's hard to get people to pay attention to it when it's in this massive uh, budget. We've got two wars going on. Why are you asking me about these helicopters from Panama um, or whatever? Uh, the Defense Department uh, pays for some of the grant aid to the region. Um, it pays for um, most trainings these days. Uh, a lot of it, special forces and other military training to the region are giving classes. Um, and pays for nearly all of all these events, these seminars and get-togethers and exercises and deployments where um, they spend a lot of time uh, training or just meeting their, uh, I think it's the other one, do side by side with, with the military of the region. Um, there's a lot less required reporting um, uh, on the programs that go through the defense budget, um, uh, which are uh, mainly counter drug programs for Latin America, but there's a host of new programs that started in the war and terror context that are used more elsewhere than in Latin America uh, that, are, that are channeling aid to, to militaries around the world. Much less required reporting. The, the, the committees that oversee this stuff, I mean, they're just pleased as punch to have $700 billion going through their bill and, and much of it staying in their district, uh, you know, creating jobs, whether it, as bases or whether as defense contracts. And they don't ask as many hard questions of the Pentagon. That's why so much stuff gets funded uh, through the Pentagon to begin with. And these are not uh, as inquisitive committees. Um, we, uh, perhaps uh, paradoxically, the, the DOD officials that we talk to are often more responsive to direct requests for information. Um, often, you know, we also write a lot of analysis of security in the region, and so they, they do know that, you know, we, we pay attention to this stuff. And so they often are, are fascinated to talk to someone else who's even who's working on security in the Americas. And you get in the door and they can ask for information, and, and you will get uh, some. Certainly not, you know, there, there's still nervousness and there's still a lot of having trouble getting to know, but I've always had a bit more luck getting, you know, that 30 page PowerPoint or, or whatever. Um, you know, that has the map of where they're going to have exercises and, you know, all, the, all those things that are a little bit harder to get from the diplomats. Um, still not great, but better. Um, and these, are, oh, these, these programs are overseen by the Armed Services Committees, uh, which, um, again, are, are not very inquisitive. Um, they've had a lot of staff changes lately and um, uh, uh, have so many other parts of the defense budget to deal with uh, that they don't spend a lot of time overseeing aid. Uh, to foreign militaries, especially foreign militaries in Latin America. It's so low on the priority list, but it is often hard to get the response um, and to get them to move on something. Uh, um, the, 
Yeah, and and then of course the defense subcommittees on foreign uh, on, on the appropriations committee are even harder. On um, all these all have small staffs. The House and Senate appropriate uh, Senate House and Senate for, uh, sorry House and Senate Armed Services Committee each have less than 50 staff overseeing the entire Pentagon. So how much time do they have for these 250 300 million dollars going to Latin America? You guess. Um, and then there's other channels that we haven't made any much headway on at all. Obviously, um, the CIA, the intelligence community in general, um, you know, they, they won't even make public what their annual budget is. We think it's about $50 billion a year. Um, but, but that's a secret. So it's the kind of thing that you find out when we're all much older, uh, when, when the declassification of, of the documents finally happens. Um, we, for all I know, for instance, uh, CIA aid to Colombia has equaled all the other channels combined. I just don't know. Um, and uh, probably not. My guess is not because that's not the intention of the CIA uh, ulti initially, ultimately, in countries that we're not at war with. But it could be. We just don't know. And, um, and another hard nut to crack for us has always been the Department of Justice, which is more run by, by you know, prosecutors and by diplomats. And they are very unresponsive, are very willing to quickly say no. And those who, among those who quickly say no uh, without any... Uh, compunction uh, for, in, and it's an important agency for Latin America is the DEA. Uh, the joke is that it stands for don't even <laughs> um, But that, that's that's sort of what you know, what we go through as we try to get the information for just the tax. Onward. Great, thank you so much, uh, Adam. And uh, I want to let everybody know that um, we encourage you to uh, write down some questions in the chat box. You, if you don't see the chat box, you can open it by going to the green bar at the top of your screen, uh, assuming that you're on, uh, on, the, on the visual part of the webinar. And uh, if you hover over uh, your cursor over that green bar, you should see a box that says chat. Click on it. Uh, that will open a box um, that will allow you to uh, write in questions. Um, and uh, after Laura's question, we'll... Uh, open up the lines, uh, hoping more. There's not too much noise out there. Um, but most of you can, uh, when we do that, can uh, mute your own phone if you have a lot of background noise with a star seven. Laura, Laura Lumpy has uh, been also been doing research on the U.S. military establishment for many years. Uh, has been done stuff with Amnesty International, with uh, is now with Open Society Institute and um, has particular expertise in U.S. arms exports. And um, so I'm going to turn it over to Laura, and then uh, we'll, we'll spend the rest of our time in uh, question and answer. Hi, good afternoon, good morning, uh, as the case may be, I guess. Um, delighted to be with you and really appreciative to John and the Fellowship of Reconciliation for, for doing this. As you said, I've been researching military aid, U.S. military aid and arms exports for a very long time. and uh, I'm acutely aware that we need more people um, doing this kind of research. I dipped out of it for a while, and as John said, I'm, I'm at uh, the Open Society Foundations now, which uh, supports programming around the world in support of protecting and advancing human rights and democratic governance. Um, and as I've dipped back into it, I've been really shocked to see how, um, how badly things are going. <laughs> so... Um, Adam did a great job of talking about the um, U.S.-funded programs, military assistance, where there's a budget lever in Congress to try and um, uh, change the policies to reduce the amount of funding and military aid going to particular countries if there are strong uh, human rights concerns. I thought, given that he did such a good job, I would focus on arms exports, which is more a commercial endeavor, although not without some U.S. government um, uh, budget uh, levers. Uh, if I can get you. All right. So first thing I want to say is I've forgotten almost everything I know <laughs> about this issue. Um, but I, I put this book together that you see linked here called The Arms Trade Revealed, uh, a guide for investigators and activists. Um, I put this together based on work I did throughout the 90s. I, as with Adam, I started working on this in the early 1990s and um, out of a concern that uh, or a belief that at the end of the Cold War, there was great opportunity to change the currency of international relations. Um, and also with an understanding that with the end of the Cold War, there was going to be a lot of surplus arms production capacity that was not going to want to go away, and it was going to look for a new market, and that new market was going to be in the global south. So um, 
this book was kind of the compilation of, of really seven or eight years of work. Um, and it, while it was published in 1998 and it's quite old now, um, I really um, call your attention to the last chapter in particular, since, since our seminar here is really about, um, about methodology. Um, so for more information, section in, um, in this book uh, is full of a, a really good kind of uh, concise statement of what's out there in terms of data sources and where to go. And much of the other uh, parts of the book about the process, how the arms sales process from the U.S. works are still, are still uh, valid. So um, if you get a chance, and that's, I've, I've uh, put the website there. It's at a, my old project, which is at a place called the Federation of American Scientists. So that link that you see down there will take you to that, uh, to that book. Um, OK, so as I said, I, I dipped out of this issue for a while and, and dipped back in. And um, this, this uh, quote here summarizes pretty, um, pretty well how things are going, 465% growth in uh, foreign military sales since um, 1998. Uh, so in this, this is a quote from the former head of the Defense Security Cooperation Agency, which is one of the places that Adam mentioned a moment ago, that DISCA, as it's called for short, is the arms sales agency at the Pentagon. So this is the place that uh, works as a middleman with U.S. arms corporations to sell U.S. weapons abroad. And we used to think that this was almost all of the U.S. arms export business, or at least the, the large majority of it. Um, and with $40 billion in sales in 2009, you might hope and assume that that is the vast majority of, of the business. But I, I was astonished as I looked back into these issues to see how much, uh, how much uh, is happening in terms of arms marketing. So we have two different programs here in the U.S. Uh, for arms exports. This first one, FMS, refers to foreign military sales, and that's what that office at the Pentagon brokers, these, the, that office, DISCA, I just mentioned, they negotiate these things called foreign military sales, which is literally a contract between the U.S. government and the arms corporation uh, and the U.S. government and the foreign company, uh, sorry, foreign country. Um, so uh, the, the former head, the, the slide I had on a moment ago, talked about $40 billion in, in arms sales contracts that were signed in 2009. Well. In 2010, um, there was a potential of $102.5 billion in arms contracts signed. We don't know yet how many of those were actually signed, undoubtedly not all of them, but that is a staggering amount uh, of, of uh, arms export business that the Pentagon is undertaking. In addition, we have this whole separate track called direct commercial sales, which as it sounds is U.S. arms corporations, Lockheed Martin, et cetera, going out and directly marketing their weapons to foreign militaries, foreign governments, foreign, in some cases, ministries of interior. And in the, the last year for which we have data there, we know that in 2009, uh, there were $40 billion in weapons um, that the state, so these are, these are licenses that are granted by the State Department. So in 2009, $40 billion, with a B, uh, uh, dollars worth of weapons and equipment were authorized for licenses, and another $87 billion in defense services were approved for export in 2009. Again, not all of those deals will go through, um, but the U.S. government has given its imprimatur, its, its permission for them to go through. So we have a staggering, you know, $225, $30 $225 billion worth of, uh, $225 to $230 billion worth of sales. Now that's one is 09 and one is 10, so I, I'm conflating, um, but that's stunning. I was also surprised as I dipped back into this to see that the, the direct commercial sales actually account for more of the U.S. Uh, arms exports these days than do the foreign military sales. The GAO, the General Accounting Office, put out a report in 2010 that showed that of all of the act actual exports um, that, that uh, left the country as opposed to contracts that were signed, those first two categories there, the first two points, refer to um, contracts that were signed, uh, so, sorry, uh, licenses that were approved, not contracts that were signed. This third bullet point, though, uh, is talking about the, the actual weapons that went abroad. And so of everything that went abroad in the period 2005 to 9, 60%, more than half, were from this direct commercial sales uh, channel and 40% from the government negotiated foreign military sales channel. So you want to know how to research this stuff. I want to briefly talk about a couple overall um, uh, data sources, and then I want to walk you through one case that I've been working on recently of a particular arms sale and how 
we found out about it and how we're working to stop it. So the, the graphic on this page, the Congressional Research Service, this is an annual uh, report that comes out that is probably the most commonly cited source of data on the global arms trade. Uh, and um, what's most notable about it and what all of you need to know is, you know, that old saying, uh, lies, damn lies, and statistics. So everything um, is counting, you know, every statistic is, is counting mm. different things, and you have to know what you're, what you're getting. The main issue with this, this report, which is largely considered to be the, you know, most authoritative source, is that it's only counting the FMS, the foreign military sales. And I've just told you that more than 60% of the U.S. arms exports are actually going through this other channel. So it's grossly undercounting U.S. Uh, arms exports. And, and yet, what it told us uh, for the period 2007 to 2010 was that the U.S. already had cornered 70% of the, the market uh, for, the develop, for arms exports to the developing world, uh, even leaving aside that whole larger segment of uh, direct commercial sales. So that's one of the key resources that you would need to know about. The Congressional Research Service uh, writes those reports for Congress, and it doesn't actually share them with the public, but um, several organizations do get them and, and, um, and copy them onto their website. And so the Federation of American Scientists, which I referred to a moment ago, is one place that does that. There's also one called OpenCRS, I think, that, that, uh, that does that as well. This graphic here, again, is just uh, demonstrating the relative um, use of those two different channels, uh, the foreign military sales versus the direct commercial sales. So I'm not surprised to see that Japan, so dark black is the, um, the, the State Department licensed direct commercial sales. I'm not surprised to see that Japan and the UK uh, and even South Korea would be using uh, much more of that direct license sale, um, because generally speaking, that approach is used by company, sorry, by countries that have a pretty sophisticated um, relationship with U.S. arms corporations already, and they don't need the U.S. government to act as a middleman for them. I, will, I was surprised though, to see the UAE um, relying so heavily on that channel, uh, and uh, Israel, I thought, actually would rely on that much, much more. So that was uh, a little. Noteworthy to me. So um, the law, the, the two laws that govern the um, the weapons exports from the U.S. are, um, I, I believe Adam mentioned both of them, the Arms Export Control Act and the Foreign Assistance Act. The Foreign Assistance Act majorly sets down uh, the, the law relating to the money that is appropriated by Congress. And then, as Adam said, every year there's an annual appropriation bill that tinkers with that, to tinker with both of these laws somewhat. Um, of, the, of the sales that we were just talking about, of the entire however many, you know, potentially $100 billion in sales uh, that the U.S. is going to see, is going to realize uh, for 2010, um, some significant portion of those are financed by taxpayer money. It's something called foreign military financing. So that's all governed in the same bills that Adam was talking about, the annual appropriations bills. The majority of them, though, are paid by the, for, by the buyer's uh, own national monies. And so the largest exporter, which I'll show you a graph in a second, uh, in recent years has been Saudi Arabia by far. They've been engaged in an uh, extensive arms buying spree. Um, so the law that covers those direct, those purely commercial sales is something called the Arms Export Control Act. And it has um, a few, this, this is where we have worked to try and uh, force more transparency uh, into what's happening, uh, restraint to the extent we can. Obviously, uh, we have not been very successful in that regard. Uh, some uh, requirements for observance of human rights, democracy, military spending, budgeting issues, et cetera. Um, and again, in, in many ways, uh, these constraints, restraints have, have really eroded in the last, in the last several years. Um, the Arms Export Control Act requires three forms of transparency that I'll mention uh, briefly. One is something called the Javits List. Unfortunately, this appears to have been classified in recent years, but this is a report that comes out that's due to Congress in February that talks about what arms sales the administration uh, thinks will, it will conclude in the coming year. That would be good to have. It would give us the biggest lead time to try and challenge some of those sales. The second thing is um, the Arms Export Control Act requires the administration to um, notify Congress 30 days before it can go forward with a sale. Uh, and that is our major source of information. This, this slide here shows you, uh, so it's, a, it's an outtake from the State Department's webpage, the link down below there, 
uh, it's referring to the part of the State Department, uh, the Office of Defense Trade Controls, which is the office that grants these arms sales licenses. You click on any one of these items here and it will pull up a, a press release on the particular sale that the State Department wants to uh, grant a license for. Unfortunately, these were only done up to 2008. This was not, this level of transparency was not required by law. The State Department was not required to put them, uh, you know, kind of neatly in one place. I wish they were. They, vol they, they voluntarily did this and they stopped doing this in 2008. However, we did require in the law that these notices be published in the Federal Register. So the Federal Register for me is a key source of public information about uh, what the USG is doing in, in this realm, and we'll get to that briefly in one second. Um, the third thing then that the um, that the, the Arms Export Control Act does in terms of you know major over, uh, major transparency, and as Adam said, this is all of course prerequisite for any kind of oversight, whether by journalists, you uh, you know informed public, uh, researchers, scholars, or um, congressional staffers. It requires an annual report after the fact. This thing is called the Section 655 report. Section 655 refers to the part of the Foreign Assistance Act that requires this report. Uh, and so what it, what it can show you is um, country by country how much was licensed in commercial arms export license uh, to a country in a given year. And it refers to all these different categories which are explained at the front of this report. So for instance, category one is firearms. So you can see that um, for Bahrain, uh, in, this is from the year 2009, I believe. I can't see my heading. 2010, wh whichever year it was. Um, uh, so $200 million in guns were authorized to Bahrain. Uh, the $149 million down there is, uh, I believe, military electronics at Category 11. Um, okay. Did you hit that? Thanks. My trusty assistant. <laughs> So, um, so those are those are the basics. So you can get a little if if we if you can FOIA using the Freedom of Information Act that Adam described, get the Javits report. You have long lead time. You, the longest lead time you're going to get about an arms sale that the administration is planning. Uh, if you have a Google Reader set up on the Federal Register, it can notify you when an arms sale has been announced to Congress. Uh, and then if you get the 655 report, you can see what happened uh, in the rule of the rule, what happened in the last year. So if you wanted to build a comparative picture or something, you would, you would look for that. So we got noticed in uh, mid-September that the, um, the Pentagon, the DISCA, the Defense Security Cooperation Agency, had decided to send to Congress notification of a pretty major weapon sale to Bahrain. Now, as you probably know, Bahrain, uh, had the largest, actually proportionally the largest demonstration in the Middle East uh, in the Arab Spring. Uh, 300,000 out of Bahrain, 600,000 people were in Pearl Square uh, militating uh, peacefully <laughs> for uh, increased uh, democratic freedoms. They're not even actually calling for an end to the monarchy, but for a constitutional monarchy. They want to become ci uh, citizens and not just subjects. Um, you may also know that the United States uh, Navy's fifth fleet is headquartered in Bahrain. Um, and so, um, uh, and, and the repression, which doesn't get much coverage, at least in the Washington Post, has continued on from February. Uh, the Bahraini uh, monarchy invited in the Saudis, who are the regional powerhouse, and ha who have been buying $250 billion worth of weapons in the last uh, 10, 15 years. They invited the Saudis to come in and, um, and uh, help uh, repress the uh, democratic uprising. So in the midst of that, uh, and in particularly old times uh, um, scenario, the U.S. government sent this sale up right at the same time that 20 medics, nurses and doctors, were sentenced for terms of 15 to 20 years for having treated uh, civilians who were shot uh, or otherwise uh, injured by government forces. Anyway, so they send this arms sales notification to Capitol Hill. Um, so the first thing we see is what you see right here, and this is on the Pentagon's website. The, the, the uh, web uh, address is listed uh, at the top there. Um, next thing you can do, and this, and this is a picture of the armored Humvee that they wanted to sell along with anti-tank missiles, which would not be useful for uh, repressing the Bahraini population, but these, these armored Humvees would definitely be useful for transporting uh, military and police troops um, and for further um, keeping people down. So the first thing we did was get the fuller picture of that arms sale by going to the Federal Register, as I just mentioned. Um, then we had a clear sense of how they're arguing, what their rationale for it is. Their rationale was 
uh, regional stability and um, external peace. Uh, then what we did is we organized a sign-on letter to all uh, members of the House and Senate, uh, sorry, I said House and Congress there, House and Senate, uh, urging them to exercise their full rights as spelled out in the Arms Export Control Act to challenge this, this sale. So we asked them to call for hearings, to ask for all subsidiary information, related information, to stall the sale, and, and finally to introduce resolutions of disapproval against the sale in each chamber. We organized a briefing for Hill staff uh, with a very effective Bahraini human rights activist whose father has been given a life sentence, uh, former head of the Bahrain Human Rights Center. We conducted, probably most importantly, a lot of media outreach. We got uh, editorial in the Washington Post, lead editorial calling for Congress to bots to, to stop the sale. Uh, and eventually, with a lot of um, uh, urging um, on members of Congress, we got six senators to send letters to Senator Clinton urging her to withdraw the sale, and then more media outreach ar around that. So the result was uh, a week and a half ago, the State Department announced to the senators that it would delay uh, this arms sale, pending at least. Uh, the release of a report uh, on Bahrain human rights uh, situation there. So this is a very probably temporary victory, but it's, it's rare even to be able to do this because the deck is so stacked against us. By the time the arms sale has been notified to the, the Foreign Relations and Foreign Affairs Committee, they've already pre-briefed it with those staff. They've already vetted it and have assurances from those staff that there are no uh, concerns, no issues. We had to then, you know, embarrass those same staff and make them look bad in front of their bosses uh, and, and show them that there was a, a serious, you know, miscalculation there in terms of um, where the U.S. should be positioning itself right now uh, in terms of um, support for democracy in, in the region. Um, I just want to highlight, I'm wrapping up here, uh, highlight, so for me the key resources are um, the Federal Register I've mentioned. GAO.gov, the General Accounting Office, is often a source. The, the GAO can get information that Adam and I cannot get. So uh, if you're doing research in this area, first place you might want to go is there to do a, a search uh, for the country and the programs you're interested in, and you may well find that they've compiled some relevant information. DISAM is um, the Defense Institute for Security Assistance Management. This is a professional association affiliated with the Pentagon Office I mentioned, the Defense Security Cooperation Agency. The website there that I've given is full of all kinds of insider DOD information about how they market arms, what their plans are, et cetera. Federal Register I mentioned, the arms sales notices are published there. Federation of American Scientists. Um, so Adam's great project for Latin America unfortunately does not exist for any other region of the world. No one in the U.S. is doing the same for U.S. arms exports and military aid to Africa or to Central Asia uh, or to the Middle East. Um, so the Federation of American Scientists is about the next best general site. They've compiled a lot of these annual reports and have them in one place. So in particular, I would urge you to go to the website I've listed there, which is uh, where they have these, these government data um, compiled. So um, thank you so much, Laura and, and Adam. Um, so now it's your turn. Uh, there's a couple questions written into the chat already. Uh, I want to let you know a couple things. Um, and I'm, I'm going to, uh, in just a moment, um, turn on the sound so you all are not muted. And uh, I would encourage you that if you have a mute button on your phone that you use it um, uh, or hit star, I believe it's star seven, uh, for muting. Uh, someone, uh, Terry uh, asks, can we get a list of the important reports to look at? And um, we will be sending you a copy of this PowerPoint presentation. And uh, I'm sure that uh, one of the things that we could do in Militarism Watch is uh, make a, a, an organized list of the kinds of reports that Adam and Laura have been talking about. Um, I also uh, want to let you know that the book that Laura wrote um, is also linked to the Militarism Watch website on the resources page. Um, and um, uh, one other thing is that the, Adam mentioned the Freedom of Information Act and, and when it would be possible, you know, what, when to use the Freedom of Information Act. And we are scheduling a webinar on the use of FOIA for investigating militarism uh, probably in the first part of December. So, um, uh, and uh, Christopher asks if the presentations of the different presenters are available to be sent by email, and yes, indeed, we will be sending those out. Um, uh, I'm now going to uh, unmute you all and um, hope that worked out. Um, and um, 
one thing I want to mention is, um, uh, let's see, there's another uh, question about the, um, whether the DCS, uh, this is a question for uh, Laura, does DCS include contractors with private security contractors and private military contractors? Maybe you want to um, answer that. You know, I honestly don't know. I will take that and look. I think it would depend on if there, if the private contractor is providing military services to the foreign government. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. If it's if it's a contractor to the USG acting in a third country, no. But I can, um, I think no. That's the part I'm not sure about. So I'll double clarify that. But yeah, if the if the uh, Shea, formerly known as Blackwater, wanted to provide military training to um, the Saudi uh, National Guard, which it does do. It has to get a contract, uh, a, a license to do that. Okay. Uh, you can, I'm, uh, I'm trying to turn on the audio for everyone, but I encourage you to send your questions into the chat, uh, write your questions into the chat box, which you can open up from the green bar at the top of your screen. Um, I actually have a question for, uh, for Adam and for Laura. Um, which is if um, if you're not working with an NGO and uh, your representative uh, say you know favors invading Venezuela, uh -huh. um, how do you get a request from a member of Congress? How do you go about that? <laughs> That's a hard question. If you're not affiliated with an NGO, um, I mean, this is sort of why NGOs exist, uh, and for one thing, uh, uh, yeah, uh -huh. so that, you know, we, we have that ability to go around and do that. Um, so ask you. Ask us or go to uh, um, a, a rich a donor. <laughs> or, or maybe your senator's better. You know, if your rep is bad, maybe your senator's better. Uh -huh. um, but yeah, it's going to be hard to get uh, committee staff. Uh, to answer you and, and to even, you know, bugging them for a long time. As Adam said, you really need to build a you need to build a relationship. I think people, I think individuals can do it. In particular, uh, you know, individuals who've made themselves expert on these issues. But it, as with everything in life, it's about building relationships with, ideally, the member of Congress. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, if you're that, that, that said, I mean, there, there's. If, if your member of Congress actually has a bee in his bonnet on this issue and on the other side, uh, that doesn't always, that's, that, at least they follow the issue mm -hmm. and they might do the request for you if you phrase it right. If it's a request just for information. On Columbia work, we've actually managed to get a report into the law during the worst years of the Bush administration and, and the, you know, the like, 107th Congress uh, uh, requiring a report on uh, uh, contractors in Colombia that has the names of companies and amounts they get and, and, and all the things that, that uh, they're tasked to do. And that was because uh, the Republicans uh, who wanted to pour aid on the Colombian military and police wanted that aid to go to the police and not to the You can play up internal. So, internal. so uh, I'm, uh, I'm, uh, I'm unmuting you. And we might be getting an echo here. It doesn't have to run it right and mute again. But uh, if anyone wants to uh, pose a question to Adam or Laura, uh, uh, you're free to do so. Okay, so. Um, I have another question for you, Laura. I'm going to try and uh, mute us all again. Um, and somebody's probably on speakerphone on the list, so if you're able to turn your speakerphone off, that will, that will work better. Or your speakers go into the microphone if you're on your computer. Right. Um, so uh, my main question is, um, you know, you, you describe an enormous complex that is pretty overwhelming. And uh, I'm wondering how, how do you think about taking a piece of that in order to
I'm afraid that we were. We didn't know you were <laughs> but I don't know if Adam, if you want to take on that question as well. <laughs> so I'm sorry about that. The question of, of, of you know, do we have to I would say um, it's almost, well, there's two ones. If, if you're um, a member of like a chapter uh, of an organization, you, you have discussions and you know what your priorities are and you, you, know, you figure that out based on the information that you have coming to you. If you're, you know, if you're in Garden City, Kansas, and you're the only one who cares within 300 miles, and there's nobody to organize with, uh, then you, you know, it's almost, as, as Laura was saying, you need to follow your passion, um, or it's uh, like the, the press release effect. If you, if you happen to be on Southern Command's website, in my case, be Southern Command, and you just, you see they just had, you know, an, an exercise with a military unit that you know participated in massacres, well, there, run with that, because, you know, the, the, the NGO world might not have people who are, who are running with it enough. Um, or if you find out about an arms sale, uh, uh, you read the Federal Register in your free time, because you have it on your RSS feed, um, and you see an outrageous arms sale, um, and you don't see anyone else doing anything about it, then, then absolutely run with it. I mean, it, it's a bit more micro, and it might be about one single transaction or one single exercise, but you want to know if there's a larger pattern, and you want to keep them from being repeated. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So um, Jessica asks, um, how can we find information on specific contracts and or licenses that private military contractors hold for providing services or equipment uh, inside or outside the United States? Do you want to take that, Laura? Yeah, that's, that's tough, Jessica, because um, y- y- we can find out less about the private, uh, the State Department contracts that it's licensing than we can find out about the DOD negotiated arms sales. There's a, there's a provision of, um, of law that exempts the State Department from being able to release what's considered confidential business information. And that, that includes, they've, they've interpreted that as including, uh, you know, basic price uh, of the contract uh, and anything like specific terms. But um, they do, as I said, have to uh, submit uh, or publish in the public record uh, licenses that they want to grant, there was a caveat there that I didn't include, over $50 million or more. So um, if it's something that rises to that level, there will be a baseline of information in the Federal Register, which is searchable. So you can go into that and search if you have a particular company that you're interested in or or a country uh, that you're interested in. You can search it that way and see what you pull up, and that's a starting place. Then after that, you can try FOIA, but you're going to, there's an exemption in FOIA for uh, business information as well. Um, And so you're probably not going to get too far that way. So then you're going to have to rely on some of the relationships and the the ways that Adam was talking about in terms of, you know, trying to uh, find a sympathetic um, cog in the wheel who wants to share that information with you. And it's it's pretty tough on on the, the State Department side. As Adam said, I find them even more nervous about sharing information than the DOD. Uh, John, you've done some work on contractors. Yeah, uh, I mean, one thing you can do is uh, go to USA government, uh, usaspending.gov and search for contracts uh, that by agency and by place of location, place of performance. And um, you can, there's not a whole lot of information about what those contracts are for. Uh, but you can find out uh, quite a bit about where uh, Pentagon money is being directed, and uh, you get a sense also also what for and who the contractors are. Um, there's a, a question from um, Zoltan. Uh, if requesting specific information about practices on a base, such as weapons used on a firing range, um, should you, the request go just to the base, or is there a central agency on basis to contact at DOD as well? And while you're thinking about that, there's, a, there's another question from uh, Jennifer who asks, um, I'm concerned about recently learning what sounds like U.S. money, U.S. payoffs to countries, head of states in Central America, heads of state in Central America. How do we address or combat these uh, supposed claims? So I don't know if either of you want to take on either of those questions, and then we'll, we'll be wrapping up soon. Yeah. I, I don't know about the firearms on a particular military base. I would assume that there must be a 
something akin to a kind of inspector general on that base. But Adam, I think, has some insight there. And I'm afraid on the second question, uh, the payoffs, I'm going to have to ask Adam to. Um, we'll see. I mean, uh, if, if, if that's the example of the base, I would probably start by actually just calling uh, the base that probably has an office of public affairs. Start there. Um, you know, if they assume what you're talking about, you know, email them, be more, give them all the specifics you know. And um, they will probably um, bring in somebody in Washington or elsewhere to run interference on that, and you just keep trying. Uh, uh, if you probably, but don't, my, my, my point is start low and, and let the people higher up come in later. Uh, if somebody low, somebody low might be more ready uh, to just give you the information you need. Um, but often they get nervous and call in someone higher, and then, 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 then your cat and mouse game really begins. Um, but until you get to someone saying, no, I can't tell you that, um, and then you have to go to Congress or, or usually Congress or, or public opinion, uh, journalists start low, journalists, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, uh, as far as cash payments to heads of state, that would not be going through any of the uh, foreign aid channels uh, in the Foreign Assistance Act. Um, there's just uh, no, there, there, there are, I think there, there, there might even be a law against it going that way. Uh, money to individuals just like that, um, but you now that, that would not be going through any U.S. aid program. If it goes, if we ever give, are giving payoffs to corrupt heads of state, which of course in Central America would be a scandal that could bring down a president, um, it would be through our intelligence agencies and, and almost impossible to get information out unless you unless you have a mole inside the agency. So, so um, let's see if we have any other questions here. Uh, if anybody has any other questions, we can take, uh, I think, probably one or so more. Um, and uh, I want to repeat that uh, we are, we're recording this uh, in, as imperfect as it is, um, and we'll make this available afterwards as well as the PowerPoint. Um, and uh, I guess um, one other thing I wanted to ask uh, for you guys is, um, what kind of advice do you have for people who are just starting this? I guess, you know, what, what's been most helpful to you as you've gone along to, I mean, you've mentioned a few things to keep in mind about, you know, starting low and, and uh, you calling on NGOs and things like that. But, you know, what do you think is, is the thing that will, will keep people either motivated or, you know, effective? Well, those are two different questions. Uh -huh. <laughs> motivated and effective. <laughs> motivated for me, I'm totally driven by anger over greed. Uh, you know, pe people profiting off of others' suffering, and and me having to pay for it, taxpayers' financing. So, um, I don't know. I don't know if you're if you're, you know, driven as I am by anger slash love of others. Then then that that can um, fuel a lot of persistence, and that would be the thing I. I would say is most needed if you want to actually try and figure out um, what's happening in terms of the U.S. relationship with the place. I did a study last year on U.S. military aid to Central Asia. Probably took me about five months of you know ferreting away through 20 different funds in the DoD to find all the different ways and places that we had uh, relations going on with the military and police in Central in, in um, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan, etc. So I don't know, intellectual curiosity, persistence, uh, in terms of effectiveness, that is, I think, it depends on what you're trying, you know, if your goal is to produce a body of knowledge, then persistence and, and um, uh, you know, sheer cussedness may be what you need mostly. But if you're actually trying to change the policy, you have to recognize, as I think all of us do here, that we're up against the biggest lobby in the country. You know, the, the Pentagon is... Uh, has made military aid and arms sales uh, one of its main priorities. Over the last decade, it's, it's raised the the, um, the place of what it calls security cooperation, up with combat operations. So it's it's a core uh, DOD strategy and approach. And so you're taking that on straight on, and, and also the State Department, which is you know co-equal partner in this. So I think you have to have a um, I think you have to take on quixotic fights sometimes because you know they need to be taken on, mm -hmm. not necessarily uh, expecting that you're going to win, but never knowing who's out there and who's hearing what you're writing and saying and what impact that might have on 
others would pick up and carry forward. Mm -hmm. I would just go um, as far as being effective. We keep, we keep talking about the importance of relationships and building relationships, and uh, with, with people who have you know, access to the information or who are oversight people, be they media, be they uh, Hill, Capitol Hill legislative staffers, uh, or even be they people on the inside. Um, and how do you do that? I, 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 probably the best way is sort of to be someone who regularly tells them something they didn't know and makes them say, "Holy crap." <laughs> um, uh, and that requires, you know, getting access to the holy crap information with what, we're, what is available to us uh, requires us to do a lot of legwork. It means, you know, you're the guy who reads the Federal Register. You're the, you're the gal who, who scours the, the regional command's press releases for somebody saying something that reveals something. Or reading that second to last paragraph of, of the, uh, you know, even the Washington Post piece by their defense correspondent about something they're doing somewhere. Um, uh, but picking up on things and, and, and running with them. And, and, and if you have enough, a good enough record of doing that, then uh, uh, people you want to talk to, their doors will swing open to you more, be they reporters or congressional staff. Now, congressional staff are going to be key if you want to get better and more information, as we've said. And if you want to take their time um, with your holy crap information, you um, – First, want to sort of look at the time of year. It's a real seasonal. Their, their work is very seasonal, like you know, they're kind of like migrant farm workers. They uh, uh, don't bother them when their bill is coming up. Um, if, if the, the foreign aid bill is about to be debated, or if it just went through committee and it's going to the floor, as, as may be the case now, don't bother foreign aid staff. They will just you know, growl at you or just ignore you. Um, look at the House or Senate calendar to find out what weeks or months they're out of session. Get them when they're out of session. Uh, they're showing up at work in blue jeans and, and, and T-shirts, and 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 um, can in DC. talk to you in DC. No, in there. Oh, yeah. Some offices are pretty uptight, and more, but, but 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 most are, and and they do have a bit more time. Their bosses aren't around, you know, bugging them for things, and they can talk on the phone. Or if you're in town, if you're coming through for something, we'll, we'll even be able to sit down and talk with you. And oh yeah, you're the guy who keeps sending me all that holy crap information. Um, you know that. Uh, that, that's, and the same thing goes similar uh, for reporters who, of course, you know, have their deadlines and their rhythms too, but, but uh, may, may want to talk to you if you're regularly coming up with stuff. And in order to show that you're coming up with stuff, uh, not only just emailing key people who you found out who they are, but you know, blog, um, start a website. You don't have to be an NGO to do that. Well, great. Thanks uh, to all of you for participating. and. Um, uh, we will. Um, Sorry, there, you there, there I am. Um, uh, like I said, we will be putting the um, the recording of this on uh, the Militarism Watch website, and uh, we will be doing future webinars. Uh, and we we love your feedback about this. Uh, this is an experiment for us, so we're learning as we go, both in terms of the technology and how useful that can be, uh, as well as the content. So um, we really want to make this work for all of you out there who are working to increase your own skills and uh, public knowledge in order to address the ills of U.S. militarism. So thanks so much, and uh, we'll catch you on the rebound. Ciao. Thank you. <laughs>